My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Wednesday, August 17th, 2011, and I'm in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, interviewing Dr. Laura Boyd. This interview is being conducted as part of the inductees of the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame Oral History Project. Dr. Boyd was inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame in 2011. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Juliana. I'm looking forward to our visit. Well, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell us where you were born and give us a little background into your early life? I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My father was a chaplain at the University of Virginia at that point. And uh, from there, we, in my very young years, we went to New Jersey where he was uh, director of a YMCA. And then when I was six, we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I really grew up until I went to college. Well, take me through uh, your early schooling experience. Big schools, small schools? Public schools. Went to public schools, and so I think they were probably very similar to what we're finding today in terms of population. Uh, there was elementary, there was junior high, there was high school. But they were public schools, and I was a good student. That was very important to me as a way of uh, identifying myself. It was to, to try to be a good student and put my, you know, put my attention to my grades and to the band and orchestra, uh, which I think probably really molded me as much as anything in my school career was being very, very involved in marching band, concert band, orchestra, and anything uh, with those friends, those kids, really, whom, whom I was relating with from fifth grade through graduation as we all grew older. What instrument? Started out with trumpet. I was a tomboy growing up. Started out with trumpet and uh, was probably mediocre. And so in seventh grade, I switched to French horn, which hardly anyone played, but it allowed me to excel. And French horn's a difficult instrument, but it, it still uh, was something that I decided to tackle, and I played it on into my first two years of college. Hmm. Well, in those early years of, of schooling, did you have a favorite subject that you gravitated towards? I had a couple of favorite uh, teachers whom I gravitated towards, which made um, science my favorite for a couple of years, and it uh, made uh, history a favorite one year. But I had teachers that, whom I really enjoyed. One subject that I went into as a career was teaching German, and I really admired my high school German teacher. I had one in, in um, junior high, sort of say middle school, which we have now, but in junior high. But in high school, my German teacher was really known as an extreme disciplinarian of the old Austrian uh, kind, and he demanded perfection. And I loved his class. I even came back uh, to do my student teaching with him my senior year of college. For you, what really stood out in your mind when you, when you thought of, wow, this is a great teacher during those early years? What did you like about their teaching style? He knew how to bring out the very best in his students, and he was not willing to settle for anything less. He seemed very tough and seemed mean. Kids were all scared of him, and yet right below that, there was a softness and you knew that it wasn't mean to be mean it was mean to say you can do this and you can do better and I demand that you give me everything you've got and so I think the kids knew that nobody wanted him to be mad at you nobody wanted him to call on you because you might not be perfect uh, but um, Herr Watts uh, as he was known and and he was a physically he was a strange little man. He probably weighed about ninety pounds. He always wore the same black suit, white shirt, and black tie. And he carried what we called a stoke, a stick, a stoke, and he would just slam it down on the desk to get people's attention if he wanted to or needed to. So I know he part of his was performance. You never got a sense it was performance. But I'm sure he was like running a three ring circus and the animals were gonna do whatever he wanted. Well, during this time, were your parents uh, encouraging of education? I think it was never assumed that I wouldn't do very well in school. So, yes, they were encouraging. I don't remember. They had to be there. I mean, it had to be there from the time I was a little kid because I, it never was a possibility that I wasn't going to 
work really, really hard at school. But that was also, um, our family had pretty high standards for everybody. All of my siblings have degrees and graduate degrees. And, uh, and I think the place that I felt safe was academia, the place that I could identify um, a uniqueness um, was academia by just you know cranking out those A's and trying to win those scholarships and that mattered um, that mattered my, my family had a lot of chaos in it too and so it was very very important for me to find some place that was safe how many siblings I have two sisters and a brother okay and where do you rank in I'm the oldest of the three girls my brother uh, my half brother is uh, eight years older than I am mm. So as you're, you're growing up and you're thinking about college and doing well in school, what are you thinking about maybe for a future career? Any thoughts? In the old days, <laughs> women, you know, of course, were going to be secretaries or teachers. And that was pretty much it. And I did not want to do that. I thought for a long time that maybe I wanted to be a physical therapist. Uh, I was a little worried about um, medical school and the cost and how long that would take. So I thought about physical therapy. I didn't want to be a nurse. Um, I wanted to be more the boss than the secretary. But I really didn't know. And then I went into teaching uh, because in German because I did love German. I uh, was good at it. And I do remember very clearly in those days that was supposed to be the fallback for women as a career. You could always teach. So I wanted to, but I didn't know what else I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to major in psychology. I got to Duke, and my freshman psychology class had 500 students in it. And I didn't feel like I belonged. <clears throat> in the German department, we had about eight professors and five majors. And so I went over and majored in German and moved in that direction then continued to take some psychology courses, but then my master's and my doctorate are in psychology. So I went back to really what I think I had wanted to do when I had a little more confidence that I could do it and truly felt like I had a little more of my identity at the level of a master's and a doctorate too. How did you decide on Duke? Uh, Duke, I grew up in North Carolina which was very much like Oklahoma in terms of uh, sports was very important between UNC and NC State and Duke. And um, my father was a Methodist minister. So I uh, was able to qualify for a full ride because of his being a Methodist minister in my grades. And Duke just seemed, uh, uh, just seemed, you know, kind of a notch above at that point uh, in, in terms of the local uh, feelings. And so I, so I went to Duke and it was a beautiful campus, beautiful campus, and I had a great time. So how long after graduation you started teaching, how long did you remain um, teaching German? I taught for three years okay. until the birth of my first child. I taught for three years, loved it, loved the kids, uh, supervised the student newspaper and the German club and a few other things during that period of time and really enjoyed, again, again the individuals in my classes. That was just so important, the people contact. And I think that's been a theme throughout my life in whatever career has just been that the relationships matter. So take me through what happens next. Okay. Had a child, uh, put a husband through seminary. Uh, we served a couple of churches, and during that period of time, I got my master's degree also taught at Lafayette University in uh, Pennsylvania. Then after that period of time, uh, we divorced. I moved to Oklahoma, did my PhD in one of the very first, now I think we call them like virtual universities, but it was one of the um, long distance kinds of where I would do residencies in the summer. Mm -hmm and then be able to take classes in different ways during the year. So I did my uh, degree from here, remarried, uh, went into a practice of uh, counseling, training, and psychotherapy, and was doing that for a number of years, and 
Then we fast forward up to 1992 when I ran for the state legislature. Spent six years in the state legislature. And then after a wonderful and failed attempt to be governor in 1998, I've been very much involved in child welfare, foster care, um, and the political aspects of that since that time. Okay. I'm going to pull you back a little bit. Okay. Uh, you, you spoke about during your college years, you, you took a couple of psychology classes and you were interested. What really drew you back to counseling? I used to tell my um, supervisees that I, that I think that all of us who became professional counselors were doing that as part of our own healing and growth. Uh, my father was a minister. He was involved in the civil rights movement very, very um, intimately and highly into the sit-ins in um, the, uh, the uh, restaurants and in the sit-ins in the um, drug stores back then where um, blacks were not, uh, and we didn't even call them blacks, you know, at that time, or not allowed to eat. I was sent to a camp, a summer camp each year, a day camp, where the, there was a white congregation and an African-American congregation that the kids came together, the church got on the bus and went out to the day camp. And all of those were very, very formative on me. They were also some dangerous times during that. My parents had a very rough marriage and there was uh, quite a bit of disharmony and I was sort of the family rescuer trying to take care of both my parents and my younger siblings as well as my brother actually and uh, so there was a lot of a lot of that uh, worry growing up going to sleep worried at night and counseling was a way to work all of that through myself but also take what I had learned and take just some of the the ability to be empathetic and sit and be with others as they were in their own moments of suffering. So uh, that's what got me back there. That's what made me good at what I did. And I really thrived in that profession. I was the healthiest and my marriage was the healthiest when I was doing it for eight hours a day for other people. I can promise you that because I would sit there and think, well, how can you be mad about that laundry not being done when this person's talking about so-and-so? So it was really a, a wonderful, wonderful career. I think I was good at it. I think it was very healthy during that time, but it was because of, uh, you know, of what I um, could learn from others and and having to remind myself to, you know, to live as I spoke and to be as I would share with others that they could be. Mm -hmm. Well, you you opened your practice in Oklahoma. What mm -hmm. what got you to Oklahoma? Um, a relationship. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 man that I had dated and met on kind of the national lecture circuit. And, uh, he was from Oklahoma and and that got me here. My parents kept saying, you know, come home, come home, you know, meaning North Carolina, and I said to them, I am home. Oklahoma had the best people from the moment I got here. The best people. You can see the sky from anywhere in Oklahoma. And um, I really was home. I, I had never heard of Oklahoma. One of the older sister of a of a guy in my in the band that I hung out with in high school came out to OSU to vet school, and I remember thinking, "Where in the heck is Oklahoma? Why would she go to Oklahoma?" Um, I don't know what she did other than graduate. I've not kept up with them, uh, but that was the only other you know reference I even had to the state. But uh, it, it didn't take long until it took my heart. Well, you opened your practice and then one day you decided to run for the legislature. How did, how did that come about? Well, I opened my practice and one day decided I had to get a PhD. Ah. Here I was young, female, I had my master's, I'd practiced on the East Coast. And I'm working with um, good old boys in Oklahoma and I decided that I couldn't get older, I couldn't change my gender, uh, but at least I could be Dr. Honey mm -hmm. instead of just Honey. So that really did help me at age 28 get some more credibility uh, with, 
you know, traditional Oklahomans, men, Oklahomans in particular, because I, my specialty is marriage and family. Mm -hmm. And so um, you don't just work with women, you know, so it, uh, that really did help a whole lot. Um, and I was doing that, and then one night I got a phone call Late one afternoon, I got a phone call and said, uh, from Carolyn Thompson Taylor. And she said, Laura, will you, I'm not going to run for my seat. Will you run for my seat? And I said, Carolyn, I don't know anything about roads, bridges, taxes. I don't even vote regularly. And I, I don't know how to do that job. And she said, no. She said, you're smart. You learn quickly. You like people. You can do this job. And so I said, well, can I have overnight to think about it? Um, and she said, well, filing closes in about an hour and a half. So my husband and I went back and forth and back and forth and uh, to, trying to decide. And, and the last thing he said was, look, you, you see your first client in the morning at 8, you know, you're home by 6, life's good. We were raising two kids. You know, life's good. Um, let's just leave things as they are. And I, I was thinking that too. But when he said that, then I realized that this was an opportunity that had been presented to me that I had not sought. And I just sensed that it was one of those leaps of faith that I was supposed to take. It was a door I was supposed to walk through. I did. I have no regrets. I gave up two-thirds of a salary to take the legislative salary. Um, but I have no regrets. And so that's how I got into it and loved that career as well. Did you continue to practice while you served in the legislature? I did for a few years. I tried to. Um, I did for a few years, and it worked out very well. Uh, but when I ran for governor, I could not be available to my families in in any way, shape, or form. I mean, there was, you know, there if there was an emergency, and and there wasn't the idea of even practicing Sunday afternoon wouldn't have worked if that's what you wanted to do because you were always moving and traveling and always gone. So uh, I had to uh, give up my practice completely when I ran for governor. I'm going to get to governor in a second. Um, during your time in the legislature, uh, you were known for cha championing many issues. Could you? Touch a little bit on the Ryan Luke law for us. That's probably, I consider, one of the highlights of my career was Ryan Luke. I had tried to pass a number of child protection bills prior to 1995, and all of them failed miserably. There was an adage at that time around the Capitol that a kid bill was dead on arrival. We could talk about the length of quail season for three or four days, but a kid bill didn't even get anyone's attention. And in 1995, Ryan and Luke uh, died in January. We had the bombing in April of 95, and in August of 95, we found the body of Shane Kaufman in eastern Cleveland County. That was an opportunity when Oklahoma was just mortified that these kinds of events happened to our innocent children. And so we were able to I was able to take everything I had worked on for four years and put it together. I held a number of hearings at the Capitol, invited all kinds of different people to come and give input and learn from their ideas. And we put everything we could possibly think of in that bill. I knew it would pass, it didn't, and it was not without difficulty. We had our opponents about different things because we were requiring, for the first time, certain accountability from the judiciary certain accountability from the DAs. We were trying for the first time to give the opportunity to uh, social workers to have some say-so about children in courts. Uh, there were a number of things that were with difficulty. And I even, uh, Shane Kaufman, by the way, had, the, had been supposedly homeschooled. That was the guise under which he was allowed to go missing for nine months, even though he was dead. And so I had brought in homeschoolers thinking this is a terrible thing that we do. We have to have some accountability in homeschooling. Well, they taught me about the accountability they do have. And so there, there was a great learning, I mean, uh, all the way around. And there was still resistance all the way down to the Ryan Luke bill from certain areas that had not been under scrutiny before, had not had any accountability. At the same time, there was no way, I knew in my heart there was no way that we weren't going to pass the Ryan Luke law. 
not with what we had been through. And in fact, we passed the House uh, 99 to 1, and we passed the Senate with 50 votes. So uh, that was a very, very important time personally to me, uh, in my heart. It was also a very important time, I think, for Oklahoma to, to step up and to really account for what we, for, for our children. Um, I, you know, I believe to this moment that if I, as the state, whether I'm DHS or a lawmaker or whomever, if I am going to take a child from the current caregivers for whatever reason, I believe that it's in the best interest of that child and it's important to remove that child, I have an obligation to provide better for that child and hopefully what I would provide for my own child. And uh, we had never done that. We still don't do that very well in this state. And so my work continues. Well, you spent six years in the house. Yes. One day you wake up and you say, you know what, I'm going to run for governor. How did, how did that come about? How did the whole thought process, because that's, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. No other woman has tried it before. It took uh, another 12 years to get one elected. <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, it is a big deal, and I didn't start out thinking I wanted to run. I started out thinking um, at that point that I wanted a governor who was from Oklahoma. Uh, Frank Keating had come here, come home to run, and I felt that he was going to go back to Washington when he'd finished his term, and I felt that we needed uh, our we need someone from Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, to be the governor of Oklahoma. So I went to the usual suspects to see who was going to run and wanted to be helpful. I went to the leaders of the House and the Senate, went to the other state elected officials. Of course, all of these are men at that time. Uh, went to them and, and said, are you going to consider running? And of course, it would be an incumbent race. They were actually much smarter than I at that point. They knew it would be an incumbent race. They knew it would be difficult. They knew that raising money would be difficult, and all of them said, no, I am not going to run. And at that point, I thought, well, someone has to, and so I decided that I would. I had talked to a number of people by that time, seeing if they would run, and then I talked to a number of leaders of the Democratic Party across the state and said, if I run, will you, will you support me? And, I, and so I went ahead and threw my hat in the ring, um, and I've never regretted a day of it. Was it difficult campaigning throughout Oklahoma? It was wonderful campaigning throughout Oklahoma. I got to learn so much about the state. I mean, I loved the state anyway. But I got to, I was in every county. Um, I never spent the night in a hotel. I spent a night, I only spent the night in people's homes. And I had a great field team who would just set it up. These aren't people we knew. Uh, so I, would, I stayed in a, um, a home in some little town outside of Toka, you know, and uh, I, I'd stay, um, I stayed in Tulsa in some very nice homes. Um, I stayed in Tahlequah in the home, an African American home, and I will tell you to this moment, I do not know where the lady of the house stayed that night. It was a small house. I had the um, guest of honor room because the plastic was still on the mattress, and um, one of two TVs in the room was in, in the house was in that room, and I don't know where she stayed because there were grandchildren staying with her, and uh, she put my driver up in another room at that point. And so when people went out of their way to welcome you in and tell you about their lives and tell you about their town, um, it was just amazing. You can also drive 45 minutes anywhere in Oklahoma, and the topography changes. It is a beautiful state that most people don't know. They don't realize that. Um, it's not all flat. It's not all hills. It's not all desert. It's uh, 45 minutes and it changes completely. So traveling was really fun. Meeting the people was really fun. And one of the worst experiences was going into um, near the Texas border on a hot afternoon, I show up in a field and they opened up this metal barn 
uh, with hay to sit on where everybody was coming to uh, hear me speak. And it had to be 150 in that barn, I think. I mean, it must have, I'm sure it was a little, this was the summer, though, that was over, that we had many, many days over 100, so it was hot. And I remember having on, um, I don't remember, it was a skirt, I don't remember the skirt as well, as I do very well remember, the sleeveless, navy blue, um, silk shirt. And it took me about three minutes to look like a nursing mother. And I remember just kind of having to laugh through that because I thought I was dressed up. It might as well have been a wet t-shirt contest, you know, as far as it was just, it was so hot. And so what I learned on that trip was that you always take a change of clothes or two and that you never wear silk on a hot day. You know, that a cotton t-shirt or a cotton blouse will do you much better. So um, I just have stories from everywhere of great people, great times, um, and listening to them. I remember hearing chicken farmers in the Northeast saying to me, please don't get involved in this because we're afraid of the, of the growers, the out-of-state growers. We're afraid. Um, and we don't want our life to be any worse because this is all we can do. And um, just people who were sharing how hard they were working um, and what their worries were. What did you take away from that race? I took away from that race that if you're, that you, you have to have a message that resonates with the people. And I think I had that. And I think I learned being running against an incumbent that you have to have enough money and that it's very difficult for incumbents to raise that money. So I knew that hard work, belief, really listening to the people and if you were going to represent the people that that will take you everywhere, everywhere. I did not win that election, but I won so many things through that process. And I changed the content of the discussions for the second term of Governor Keating. Uh, there were things being talked about in terms of the environment and um, uh, growers and incubators, and there were issues about children and education that were being talked about in ways that they had not been before. And now look. And now we have a woman governor. We had two can women candidates for governor. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, we're on our way. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. And I, yeah. you know, it was interesting watching that campaign. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, boy, I wonder what Laura Boyd's thinking. Yeah. yeah. So after the run for governor, what did you do besides take a little break? Well, I didn't take a break by choice. I mean, one of the things that I didn't do, which I would encourage women to do, I think men already do this, I was focused on that race. I wasn't assuming I'd win, but I was focused on that race, which means when you don't win, there's no plan. You know, the, the, the uh, script had run out as far as that was at that point. So I, I uh, didn't know whether I you know, mattered anymore. I mean, these are all things to me because, you know, I had always been, I had always worked. I had always focused in on some job, you know, or some goal. And now there was nothing that I either had to do, was expected to do, and actually could do. I mean, I was unemployed. You know, I had not set it up to have something in the wings. And so it was about six months of really trying to come to terms again with uh, what do I want to do with my life, and um, and am I significant in in the world, um, in my world anymore? And uh, uh, it was not pl not necessarily pleasant, but it was important because if it did nothing else, it let me rest. One of the other things I did during that time is I just happened to find on the internet one day a fellowship called the Eisenhower Exchange Fellowship. And I applied, and I won a fellowship to Peru the next uh, fall to work with women who, well, to work with their government, really, in, and uh, women advocates who were trying to figure out how to have a voice in the political system. So that was probably the real hidden treasure that came in that period of time. And it was just a fluke of, you know, nobody loves me and looking around on the Internet. And I thought, well, I'm going to apply for this. I don't have a job, I'm going to apply for a fellowship. 
and I got it. And how long were you in Peru? I was in Peru. The fellowship itself on the ground in Peru was about six, six weeks. And with the way the Eisenhower Fellowship works, and it's been an important part of my life, is there are probably about 35 uh, leaders from around the world who come to the United States each year. And there are five or six U.S. citizens who go somewhere in the world each year. And I was in that class in 1999. And since then, most years, I've spent some time hosting someone from some foreign country here in Oklahoma for anywhere from two days to five days of their tours across the United States. And it has just been wonderful to spend some time with someone from Indonesia here, from Turkey, uh, from Peru, from uh, j this past fall I had someone from Palestine. Mm -hmm. It's just been so rich to, to show them about Oklahoma. And the feedback that I hear from uh, Eisenhower people in Philadelphia, their home office, consistently is that their time in Oklahoma was the highlight of their trip or was among the highlights of their trip. And I think that says that what those international visitors pick up on is the same thing that I saw when I came out from North Carolina. There's a quality of the people, there's a genuineness and an openness, there's a sense of volunteerism and we're all in this together that is in Oklahoma that is unique not only to the United States but probably to the world. So what's next? Well, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing at the moment, um, which is I um, own a company, a consulting company, but my two major contracts in that company are one is executive director of the Oklahoma Therapeutic Foster Care Association. So I spend much of my time representing 13 agencies that deliver therapeutic foster care across the state. All of those are DHS kids. They're all high level foster children with mental health issues and behavioral health problems that require intensive services beyond traditional foster care. So we're like a mini DHS. Um, they are all DHS custody kids, but we recruit, train, supervise, deliver services for our children all across Oklahoma. I also uh, spend a week a month in Washington in my other major contract, which is representing therapeutic foster care nationally, representing it to the administration and to policymakers on Capitol Hill, and consulting for the 50 states about uh, issues of foster care and child welfare and helping them navigate some of the uh, same issues that we do here, but able to share that with any state about what many other states are doing so that we can hopefully really respond to this, this level of future citizen that uh, has, again, they, we've taken them from another situation. We must provide better for them than they have, and we should provide for them as if they were on our own child. Is it difficult uh, lobbying or uh, at the national level uh, with some of the things going on with our government right now? Well, it's certainly frustrating at this very moment when there's all you, all you hear is blame. And frankly, when the issue, what, what's vulnerable on the chopping block are the constituencies who have no voice of their own, and that is children. Uh, seniors at least band together and speak for themselves. I am amazed that when most people, the majority of people in the world, are parents or have been parents, that they don't even, there's no voice for children. There's no voice for children. And so that was, true bef that was true before it's just gotten more intense. It was true during the health care debate for two years. My work nationally was I wanted to just make sure that foster children were included in whatever came down the pike for health care reform and Medicaid. Today that's morphed into tr discussions with the exchanges that are being set up in each state, the health care exchanges and the basic benefits packages to make sure that 
the needs of foster children are included in those. Um, the, uh, it, it is frustrating, but one of the things that is exciting is that when I, when I go into DC and have meetings, it really is all about the kids. They couldn't care less, and more and more I see this here in Oklahoma too, but I have no history that I bring with me. I'm not a Democrat or Republican. Children, I, I am there advocating for children, and um, I, I relish that. I take great, great joy in being able to say this isn't about politics. This is about what's right and what's wrong, and this is about uh, what we owe, what we owe, um, you know, our most vulnerable citizens. So I like that. Well, tell me about the policy and performance consultants. Uh, is that a group you founded? Yes. That is the company that I founded. Actually, I founded that company in 1994, and um, it was pretty much just me doing a few little things while I was in my political career all during that period of time. We have, um, I have, six other consultants who are part of that consortium now. They are not employees. We are all independent uh, contractors. But what we have found is that, again, as a community, we have more to offer. As each of us has certain things that, that interest us or opportunities that come our way, there are strengths that, that one of our colleagues has that the other one um, can build on or build into their program or their dream of how this could happen for a particular organization or a particular branch of government or a particular um, a private business. And so it, that has also felt like just another way to, to be more than, than we are individually and to have a, a great uh, collegial um, professional relationship and friendship. Now, during that time, did you ever think, maybe I want to get back into politics? I thought it for a long time. I thought it for a long time. And the only thing that probably kept me away from it is I knew it would kill my husband. <laughs> I really did. I really did. Um, he was always very, very supportive. But one of the things most people don't know is uh, when I ran for lieutenant governor in 2002, that was a very difficult time. First of all, it was supposed to be an open seat. See, I'd learned it was supposed to be an open seat. And so I had announced, and then Mary Fallon decided not to go for governor, but to run for a third time for lieutenant governor. And so here I was back right again with the incumbent situation um, and, with the and therefore with the difficulty of money. That was in February, late February, I believe it was, maybe early March that that, that happened. March 18th, my husband was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer. And so in the next six months of the campaign, we went through more than 15 surgeries and probably the equivalent of uh, 18, 20 days full time in the hospital overnight in different, uh, with chemo at different points in time. I hired a, uh, there was the whole summer, he had uh, chemo, he had chemo and radiation, chemo once a week, radiation twice a day for six weeks in Midwest City, and so I had to hire a driver who would take him up in the morning, and then I could work on the campaign, and then I would go pick him up and bring him home. So it was, it was an extremely difficult time, and uh, what I said during that time was that, you know, it made it possible for me to survive both, that, you know, I couldn't focus only on the campaign because I had my husband, but I couldn't, couldn't get swarmed under cancer because I had a campaign, and I, I think I told myself that to survive or to make it as healthy in a difficult situation as I could. What I know in retrospect is that I did not run a good campaign. I couldn't run a good campaign. Um, I would not have changed that because uh, my commitment was to be with my husband first. And so when I say it would kill him, I mean, he still suffers from the ramifications of all those years, although he's in remission. And um, I think if it didn't kill him, you know, he might just find a way to help it kill him if I ran back if I went back into public office. I just don't think his health could take it and I don't think he'd want to deal with it. And and what I've learned in the last couple of years is how I can really affect st still really affect and in fact even in more significant ways the area of child welfare by what I'm doing now. So I may not be able to save 
state of Oklahoma, or save the world. You know, I can't be spread out in the things that I'm, all the many things that interest me and that I might have wanted to do in political office. But I can do even more in this area of child welfare and foster care than I could do in elected office in that realm. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe even a little more. I think a little bit more, and it's been very satisfying and very exciting. When it's not totally frustrating, it's very exciting. Well, you know, we, we learn the background for our careers in many different places. Sometimes it's in the classroom, a lot of the time it's not. Uh, looking back on your career, be it education or counseling or politics, where do you think you've learned the skills you needed for your career? In retrospect, I think I learned it all from my parents. I really do. My father was a peacemaker. My father was a counselor as a, as a, uh, a chaplain. Uh, my father took on challenges and represented the underprivileged, uh, being African Americans at that time. My mother was a secretary for the North Carolina legislature for 35 years. And so it was only after all that, because I had no interest in politics, my mother made her paycheck in politics. My father was very politically involved in policies, you know, and in, in terms of um, public image and awareness of, of what was going on in, in the culture at that time. So, you know, I very independently was not, had no interest in politics. And then lo and behold, I think it was all that upbringing, and as well as my um, political role in a dysfunctional family that uh, totally primed me for politics as well as for what I'm doing now. Well, looking back, you know, we, we don't like to dwell on the negative, but I'm sure there's been some adversity uh, that you've had to overcome. Uh, anything that comes to mind off the top of your head as you look back on your career? Uh, I think my husband's cancer. Um, I think my mother's mental illness. Um, I think those were two big things that stand out for me. I think some very um, positive things are my children, um, my husband. Um, I think there's some really rich things that have formed me into who, into whom, who I am now. Uh, but if I were just right on the top of my head in terms of my own personal experiences and adversities were probably my mother's, uh, my mother's mental illness and my, um, my husband's cancer. I was still young. I was only like 44 when he got cancer, so still young. Well, tell me a little bit about, when you look back, career highlights. Things that you just think, wow, I did that. Um, running for governor, the first woman to run for governor in the state of Oklahoma. That's probably the, the first, or the biggest wow. I think Ryan Luke is a big wow for me. That matters a whole lot to me. Um, when I taught at Lafayette College, I was on faculty with just a bachelor's degree. I didn't even have my master's at that point. So that was a pretty big wow for me that, you know, I applied for a job. We all, I interviewed with others and I was chosen and that was important uh, to me. Um, and I think I was tickled pink when I got my first teaching job. I was supposed to, I had a German degree, I was supposed to go work for a travel agency. I was going to work six and a half days a week. We had to work on Sundays, Saturdays, and my salary was going to be $85 a week. And the week before I was supposed to take that job, I interviewed for this opening about 45 miles away, so I had to commute while my husband was in graduate school, um, for a German teacher. And I was just tickled to death to get that. So. Each of those were very important in terms of my feeling like, wow, you know, I got that, I did that, I can do this, and um, moved me on to whatever was coming next. Well, in 2011, you were inducted into the Oklahoma Women's yes. Hall of Fame. Yes. Uh, what was going through your mind when you got the phone call? Uh, I was thrilled. <clears throat> um, I was humbled and I was honored. Um, I didn't tell anybody right off. I didn't know what to say or how to say it. And to this day, a lot of my friends find out later or don't know, uh, unless they, they were reading the paper or, or happened to um, 
be in my most inner circle, you know, in, in which case I invited them to come. So I was really surprised. I, I've always been somebody, I want to be noticed, but I don't, I mean, I want, to, I want to know that you noticed me, but I'm real uncomfortable at the time of being noticed itself, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't know how to explain that. So um, I'm thrilled that I'm in the Hall of Fame. I dreaded getting the award. You know, I dreaded getting the award in the sense of I just don't want to be up there and, um, and be that focus of attention. But I'm so delighted to have been noticed, and I'm so proud that somebody, you know, nominated me and that folks selected me for that, that esteemed honor. Um, so it, it was hard to know what to do at first, but I was so proud the day of, of actually the induction. Um, the girls came up and told me that um, my husband cried, you know, he, and he's gotten to an age where he gets very emotional about a lot of things. So he's back there crying, and a uh, 15-year-old granddaughter whom we've raised was just up all the time taking pictures, very few of which actually came out. But, you know, it was fun seeing her up there. I mean, the family was so happy, and they were so excited um, that that helped me get over my self-consciousness, but also any um, self-absorption about what is, what, what is going on with me. That just really wasn't very important. What was important was, you know, just letting that day happen and enjoying it and taking it in and seeing other people's joy, um, too. And so it, it was just a wonderful experience. Do you remember who presented you? Yes, Cindy Kaysen presented me. Uh, she is one of my colleagues in Policy and Performance Consultants. She is, and I can say this because she's, she says it, it's given me much permission. I, um, her family was one of my client families uh, about 18 years ago, and I got to know them all very, very well. Uh, first time I met Cindy, she's heard me tell the story too, so usually if you've had somebody who's a client, you're not supposed to say this stuff, but it's, this is public record, she's fine with this. Um, I wasn't sure I liked her too much. Her husband brought her in for marriage counseling, and I thought, I think I could see why. You know, I didn't say that. I think I could see why. Um, her husband, a few years later, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia, and so I spent about nine years really work. In fact, they call, she called me on Christmas Eve. He had been diagnosed and said, what do we do? And I said, you don't tell the kids. Tomorrow's Christmas. You do not tell the kids. You know, so anyway, we just kind of walked it through for nine years. For nine years, we walked it through. And, um, of course, over that period of time, um, the relationship was still very much, I was, I was the therapist for the family. And then with Robert's passing, um, we became friends very, very quickly, friends and colleagues. And so, yes, Cindy Kaysen uh, nominated me, and that also was just so special, so special. Well, through, throughout everything, your, your work is so varied from education to public policy to politics. Uh, when people look at you now as a role model, even though you may not directly see that uh, every day, what, what goes through your mind? I hope they, well, here's what I hope they would see. I would hope that they see someone who is enjoying working hard. I would hope they recognize some sense of competence. I would hope that they that somehow though I do that in a way that's still feminine, that you know that there's some sense that you know she can be competent and uh, and a woman. Um, I think. You know, I hope that they see that. I hope that's. I hope I project that. I mean, I hope I project that, and therefore I hope they see that. I, I hope that's. Um, and then I hope they say, you know, um, I can too. Um, I can work hard. I can. I can be happy in what I'm doing. I don't have to do the same thing all the time. Uh, I can do what I'm passionate about. What I, and, and what I, what I think I'm supposed to do. I hope they. I hope I give that out to them. You know, you, you've you've mentioned your your parents, um, your German teacher. Yeah. Is there, and I'm sure the list is very long. Is there anything you'd like to say about the people who who've really played an important role in your life? 
There have been many. Um, there have been a few who stand out and a few who are key. But I think one of the things that um, that I've always done, one of the things I coached clients to do is um, there, you can learn something from everybody. And look for what it is that you're wanting to learn. Uh, what I'm learning right now and what I'm looking for and have been for a few years now is I'm watching um, folks in their 70s and 80s whom I I feel are aging with elegance and with real competence. Um, I'm watching them because I want to learn that. You know, I want to be that. Um, and there's not just one person who's going to teach that to you. Um, I want to I want to take the best of all, and then I'm going to be that one person who want, you know who's got it all, <laughs> so to speak. You know, but I think whatever it is, you know, you learn something from everybody, and especially the people you don't like, especially the people that are hardest to get along with. Um, you know, if you'll pay attention, you will really learn something. Uh, if not about them, then about you. And so there's, I think I've lived that way for so long that um, one of the fantasies I do, I have along that line is, okay, at my funeral, who will care to come? Who will care to come? Um, I don't know. But uh, when I get the snapshot of who's there, then I'm going to go through, you know, I guess I did matter to them. And um, I had no idea that what I said was important for her. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a fantasy that I play with myself all the time, uh, is um, learning from anybody I, I can learn from and then trying to give it back. If you could give any advice to Oklahomans, what would you tell them? I would tell them to hold on to the roots and the traditions and the values that make us unique, like caring for each other, caring for one another, respecting independence um, and self-sufficiency, but but being there for each other so that um, someone's not alone and that help is available. Our generosity, you know, hold on to those things. Don't hold ourselves back. From, uh, from morphing into new people as well, though. We can have our roots and our values. And we're smart and unique and creative with the ability to be outspoken and to be on the cutting edge, whether it's science, whether it's human services, whether it's politics, whether it's education. We are able to do those things. So um, we can be progressive, and we should be progressive, because who else is going to lead into new areas with that value system if we don't do it? Um, just those who are probably either purely entrepreneurial or uh, pure, purely out there to satisfy their own egos. No, we have to create and lead and voice and forge that newness with that value system. And then I think we'll be the very best of America if we'll do that all the time. And for women who plan on maybe following in your footsteps, any tips? Yes, you can do it. You can do it. We've, cut, we've made the way, the cloth is cut. Okay, you can tear it a little further. You've got every ability to do that. Um, and um, anybody who wants to run for public office, I don't care what party, I would be glad to talk to them individually and tell them the same thing. Um, not only can you do it, but if you've got that inkling, then let us support you. Because, because the world needs that female perspective. We just do things differently. Different things matter, and things matter in different ways. The world needs both the male and the female, perspective, ego, vulnerabilities, strengths, and we're not there yet. We haven't contributed our half. We need to do that. You know, you're not from around here, but you've made Oklahoma your home. Absolutely. What does Oklahoma mean to you? Well, it is my home. I've been here more than half my living years. Um, 
Oh, what does it mean to me? Um, it means all kinds of possibilities. Uh, it means just beautiful terrain. It means uh, seeing God every day in the sky because of the sky. Um, it means um, hard work. It means hard, hard life, but, but a rewarding life. I mean, I don't think things are easy in Oklahoma. And, you know, if there's value in working for what you got or, you know, and whether that's, you know, just the paycheck at the end of the day or the family that you've managed to keep together through bad times or the, you know, the election you win, um, you know, there's a sense here that you can make happen uh, what it is you believe in. And that to have beliefs is so important. Um, Oklahoma is, we're just, you know, we are good, good people, as well as smart, capable, and um, energetic people. But we are good, good people. And we, you know, in Oklahoma, if nowhere else still, um, you know, your your word is who you are. Oklahoma is a wonderful, wonderful, and, and I just giggle whenever, I love it when somebody comes to Oklahoma for the first time. Um, because they, they might as well go to Disneyland. They might as well go to Disneyland. They are just that impacted. You know, we, we, we haven't really touched upon the many groups you're involved in within the community, uh, the many awards you've won. There, the list goes on and on. Um, but what is next for you? What's the next big thing on your radar? You know, you continue to advocate for yeah. our children, uh, not only here in Oklahoma, but nationwide. Is there anything you have out there on your, your agenda? Well, I, when you say the big thing, I don't know. I think there's going to be another chapter. I sense there's another chapter. But some of the, one of the things that's kind of big that I'm delving into right now is really kind of working with tribes about their foster care systems and how we can maximize um, the, the state tribal relationships um, maximize the resources that the feds might have, but it's my experience that the best place for tribal youth in foster care is with a tribal family, and um, I want to see that capacity happen for our tribes, as well as I've been asked to look at some tribes in other states. I, I believe that's important. We haven't done that in this country. We take care of tribal children, and we deal with the um, Indian Child Welfare Act, and we deal with the rules and the regs. But most Native American foster youth are with American uh, Caucasian or other families who are doing their best to take them to powwows or to do this, and that's not the same. It's still, these children have already been traumatized, and to be taken away from their identity, uh, even to a wonderful, wonderful foster home, is not giving them the best that they should have. It's not the way I would want my Native American child, if I had a Native American child, to be taken care of. So that's an area that I'm moving into, and I think there can be some really exciting things there. I think it'll take us a long time and a while, but you know, that, that's what's on the horizon within the last month, and I think it's going to go somewhere. That sounds exciting. It's going to be fun. It's going to be good for kids. Oh, yeah. And it's just right up your alley. It's going to be good for kids, yeah. Uh, before I ask my last question, is there anything else you'd like to make mention of today that I haven't covered? I, the only thing I can think of is really thanking um, the commission for the award and thanking OSU for the Oral History Project. Um, I think this is a way we leave a legacy for those to come, and it will be through the eyes that you are making available to future generations that they're going to know and they're going to have the opportunity to take something that I've said and that each of us forties has said and say, wow, that makes sense for me. I can do that too. Well, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? I, oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> I hope it will say um, she, she lived and loved with her whole heart and um, she never backed down from a fight when it came to sticking up for kids. 
I think that's a good way to end. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Juliana. I appreciate it very much.